Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining our Wellness Wednesday session. Um, today we are going to go through understanding sleep and hopefully I won't put you to sleep, but I'll help you get a better night's sleep tonight. <laughs> so just to start off with a few, let me see, go with a few tip or a few um, facts. Um, it is actually thought that up to 15% of the population are sleepwalkers, um, which I thought was quite interesting. Don't know if you know any sleepwalkers, <laughs> um, but yeah. Um, and then 40% of people actually suffer with sleep issues. And I'm sure all of us watching today at some point um, will perhaps have had difficulty getting off to sleep. There are many effects of lack of quality sleep, so it can affect us physically, mentally and emotionally. Um, it can also have a direct effect on our productivity, our decision making skills and also our relationships. So, for example, if you're feeling really tired, you may be a grumpy tired and therefore you may answer people not in the nicest way, in particular loved ones. And that could create an argument and that can create relationship problems over a prolonged period of time. Also, lack of sleep or lack of good quality sleep can have long term effects and it can really be detrimental to health. So another example would be, you know, when we sleep, if we're not going into a deep sleep, we're not allowing our body to actually repair itself. Um, and also, you know, our deep sleep allows our brains to actually learn and remember um, what we've actually maybe carried out throughout that day, etc. And it sort of rejuvenates you. So as we touched on in the last slide, sleep can really also affect our immune health. So hopefully, you know, from all these sessions that we've held, whether you've watched them live or afterwards, you know, you can sort of see that there's a common theme that everything is interlinked in some shape or form. And so is our immune health. So cytokines, these are a type of protein and they target infection and inflammation and ultimately they create an effective immune response. They are only produced and released during sleep. So if our sleep pattern is not particularly good or we're not sleeping well, obviously we will produce less cytokines, which then can have an impact on our overall health and well-being. So for instance, you know, if we think of our immune health, chronic sleep loss um, may make the flu vaccine less effective um, because it's reduced our body's ability to actually respond to the vaccine and for it to be effective. Now, you may have heard of a sleep-wake cycle, so we're going to explain this a little bit. And it is a little bit complicated as the next couple of slides go on with when we talk about hormones, etc. But hopefully it'll all kind of come together in the end. So there's a thing called the penile gland in the brain, and this actually regulates our sleep-wake cycle. Now, this gland receives and interpret, interprets light and darkness signals um, and this gets it from the we get this from the signals from the eyes and then the chemical messengers translate these signals into the production of melatonin and melatonin is a hormone that makes us feel sleepy. So melatonin then, it's actually controlled by light exposure, which again links back to the sleep-wake cycle. Um, and when it's dark, our brain secretes this melatonin. This makes us sleepy. And then obviously when it's lighter, we don't have as much melatonin and that helps us stay alert and awake. However, there are other things that can affect the production of melatonin, particularly in this day and age. Um, so that would be exposure to light. So if you're trying to go to sleep in a light room or when the clocks go forward in the summer and we've got longer hours of sunshine, um, you know, and you don't have dark curtains, this potentially could affect your night's sleep. Also, using technology before bed can affect your sleep-wake cycle because um, of the production of melatonin. So, 
A quick tip here is to ensure that you've got access to bright light in the morning and this will help you feel more alert and awake. And then going in the evening, if when or just before you're going to bed, if you make sure that you know, it's nice, dark um, light and your room is pitch black, that will help. So just to touch on some other hormones here and hopefully you will have kind of seen the link back to last week's session on or this the session on cho chocolate. So the penile gland has receptors with both dopamine and serotonin and serotonin is actually a chemi chemical precursor to melatonin. Now your body needs serotonin for the penile gland in order to produce the melatonin and the melatonin is what helps us sleep. So it's all interlinked. There are five stages of sleep, which I'll take you through in the next slide, but these actually fit into two categories. Non-rapid eye movement or NREM, and this is where our eyes rest and our body heals. Then we have rapid eye movement or REM and this is where the body becomes immobile and the mind starts to energise itself and both these types are really important throughout our whole sleep cycle and throughout the night we will go in and out of each of these kinds. So there are five stages then of sleep. The first stage is in non-rapid eye movement and this is where we're just starting to go to sleep and we'll float in and out of consciousness and eventually you know it will lead to a light sleep so we're not in a deep sleep just yet. Stage two is also non-REM and this is where we spend approximately 50% of our night's sleep. Um, at this stage, our eye movement stops and our brain waves slow down and this re results in our heart rate actually slowing down and our body temperature decreasing. Stage three and four, so I've grouped these together because it depends on where you read up, will depend whether they um, have a four sleep stage or a five sleep stage cycle and whether they combine these two stages because they do kind of flit one, you know, into one another quite quickly and easily. So this is the deepest stage of sleep and it's the hardest to wake up from. So whenever you do wake up, if you've been woken up, you may feel a bit groggy. However, if you've woken up naturally from this stage, you will feel nice and refreshed. Our blood pressure and our breathing become much deeper and slower in this phase, and it is one of the restorative parts of sleep. But that's more coming into stage four is more of the restorative sleep. And then finally, stage five. This is the only stage where we have rapid eye movement and where we should or most people will spend around 20% of their sleep in this stage. Our breathing then becomes much shallower and our heart rate rises whilst our muscles and limbs are par paralysed. Now this probably sounds quite scary in the sense what you know, our, our body's paralysed but this allows for you know our body to sort of be restored for the day ahead. Um, we apparently do most of our dreaming um, at this stage and this is because of the brain waves being desynced um, and basically this stage is more like we are actually awake. So those are the five stages. Just another quick stat here, you know, so people who don't get enough sleep are more likely to have bigger appetites due to the fact that their leptin level, so this is an appetite regulating hormone, fall and this promotes appetite which increases our appetite and perhaps more um, snacking. So again if you think logically to that statement when you're tired and you're feeling real groggy and you feel like you're lacking energy but perhaps it's just tiredness you do tend to snack more and dare I say it snack more on higher sugar fat foods. So we're going to go a little bit back to the hormones again, um, 
but this is what can actually affect or have an impact on our sleep. So we'll touch on tryptophan, which we actually spoke about when we talked about chocolate and mood. So again, it's all linked and you know it's why we may choose for certain foods. So tryptophan, as we have already set, found out, is it's an essential in humans. Um, so this means that we actually can't produce it ourselves. We need to get it from food or our diet. And the body on this occasion linked to sleep uses tryptophan to turn into vitamin B3, also known as niacin. Niacin then is, a key, is key in creating serotonin and serotonin as we've sort of discussed in previous sessions helps um, with your mood but it's also a neurotransmitter and it's associated with sleep and melatonin levels because it, it's a precursor of melatonin. So some foods that we can get tryptophan from are protein foods. So good sources are chicken, turkey, eggs, peanuts, soya beans, milk, yogurt, cheese, pumpkin and sunflower seeds. So you can see it's a real mix. It's not just plant sources and it's not just animal sources. So carbohydrates also play a vital role in um, the release of um, melatonin because carbohydrates cause your body to release insulin which removes all the amino acids so tryptophan is an amino acid so it, carbohydrate removes all these amino acids except for tryptophan from the blood which makes it more available to the brain let's see oh sorry and therefore, you know, tryptophan can enter the brain more easily. This then will boost your serotonin levels and that will have a direct effect on melatonin. Um, so you may kind of associate carbohydrate heavy meals as feeling drowsy, but this is the whole effect of tryptophan moving up to the brain with serotonin, which can lift your mood, but if it's converted into melatonin, it will start to make you feel drowsy. Um, another food that can have an impact on your sleep is caffeine. Um, so caffeine is a stimulant and obviously that makes you feel more alert, may give you a wee buzz, a bit of a pick me up in the afternoon. However, you know, you may want to switch to decaf in the evenings because you don't want to feel it be feeling alert when you're trying to start to wind down and fall asleep. So what else then can affect um, our sleep in terms of food? So I'm just going to put up a few facts here that I find that are quite interesting and then we link it all back to our diet. So a diet low in fibre and high in saturated fats has been shown that it may decrease the amount of deep sleep. Eating too much sugar could result in more midnight wake ups. So again, sugar is gives you energy, it gives you that boost. So you can kind of understand that once the sugars are released, it, you know, and you're starting to go to bed, you know, you may actually become more alert. A diet that's high in fiber and low in added sugars could actually help you drift off to sleep. And if you think logically again, so fiber is a carbohydrate. Carbohydrate helps the body to transport tryptophan to the brain, to serotonin, which then helps it be made into melatonin. So you can sort of see the, the, the link here. And then fried or high fat meals, spicy food, alcohol, any kind of fizzy drinks, etc. They, for some people, give them heartburn. And if you're eating just before you go to bed, any of these sorts of foods, it may actually increase the risk of heartburn, which increases the, the, the risk of not sleeping as, or finding it hard to go to sleep and not sleeping as well. People that also have a diet high in these foods and do suffer from heartburn are more likely to have sleep problems and disorders like insomnia, sleep apnea, restless legs, 
uh, restless leg syndrome, and they may even feel sleepy during the day as well. So, just want to bring you back to the good old Eat Well guide. It is in all of my sessions, and rightly so, because it does promote good health, and hopefully you're now seeing how everything is interlinked. For me, it is important to enjoy your food. And if you have a healthy balanced diet, you should be able to get everything that you need. And there's no real reason to worry about your kind of specific nutrients and hormones, because if you mix your foods and have a good balance, you should be able to get everything that you do need. But what are the key things you know, in terms of sleep that we can touch on? So. Base your meals around starchy carbohydrates, opting for whole grain varieties. So as we've said, carbohydrates help with the reduction of tryptophan, which helps, which helps the conversion into niacin, which helps the production of serotonin, which is a precursor of melatonin. So all linked. So just carbohydrates, base your meals around them. Aim for five a day. So eat a rainbow of colours and one portion is one handful. Now, you may ask, how is this linked to sleep? But our, all our fruits and vegetables provide us with an array of vitamins and minerals. And these vitamins and minerals help us to sustain good organ function, help us to transport nutrients to all the respiring body cells and tissues, and to ensure you know, that we get what we need. So it's really important to have a good mix of these in our diet. We should also include milk and dairy. You know, milk is part or one of the, the foods that um, has tryptophan in it. So that will help, but up for the lower fat dairy alternatives. And we should also be consuming a variety of plant-based and animal proteins. So as we said, you know, protein foods contain tryptophan. Um, and it's not just meat or plant sources. So having a good mix will ensure that you get a good mix of the amino acids, which are needed for other functions within the body. But also, it will provide you with tryptophan as well. However, you should aim for fish twice a week, one of which should be oily. Reduce red or processed meats, so aim for no more than 70 grams per day, and choose leaner cuts of meat as well, as these will be lower in saturated fat. And obviously, we've discussed the impact that foods high in fat and sugar can have on heartburn, etc. Um, and that's all interlinked or you know, can be detrimental to sleep as well. Alcohol and sleep. So we did touch on alcohol and sleep in our alcohol wellness session. However, I'm going to talk about it again. <laughs> um, so alcohol, you will think, will help you to nod off. And this may happen or may do this for some people. However, it doesn't promote a good, healthy sleep pattern. It can actually disrupt it. Um, and we, this is because we spend less time in the restorative part of sleep, so the rapid eye movement part, so that's stage five. And this will make us fe wake up feeling pretty rough, groggy, like we haven't really slept because our body hasn't been able to kind of restore itself. Alcohol is also a diuretic, so in other words, it makes you go to the toilet more frequently. Um, so that is obviously going to disrupt sleep. If you are going to drink alcohol, you know, we all like a glass of wine or two every so often, you know, try not to have it, you know, really late at night. Start off maybe in the evening and then switch over to um, just an, an, a glass of water, squash, Coke, Diet Coke, etc. Um, rather than alcohol. So exercise is another one which is debated as to whether it's helpful or not in terms of sleep. So exercising regularly makes it easier to fall asleep and contributes to sounder sleep. However, exercising sporadically or right before going to bed will make you fall asleep more or make falling asleep more difficult. Um, so let's talk about this one now. <laughs> exercise can make you feel more alert. And believe it or not, there's actually optimal times during the day for exercise to be able to reap the benefits of a solid night's sleep. 
Um, effectively, it's better to hit the gym in the morning or the afternoon rather than in the evening. Um, by work, if you work out in the morning, you will enjoy apparently deeper sleep at night, and in the afternoon, the session will allow your body temperature to rise, but then also it gives it time to fall before you go to sleep so that it's at an ambient temperature to ease sleep. Um, because you, you can't really, it's difficult to go to sleep if you're feeling too warm and um, sweaty, etc. And obviously evening exercise doesn't really promote this because, you know, we've raised our body temperature if we're working out or, you know, if you go for a run or have done an aerobics class, as well as it stimulates our, bra our brain, so it makes us feel more alert. Now, the sleep benefits for some people, you know, may be greater than others. Um, research is still not overly conclusive. Um, and you've got to do what works best for you. I mean, most of us can only really exercise in the evenings and there are other health benefits of, ha of participating in regular exercise, um, not just you know, sleep. And it also may depend on the type of exercise that you do. So you know, if you are having problems going to sleep, and you do want to exercise, it may be that you go for um, yoga or Pilates where you are still toning and stretching and doing a form of exercise, but it is a more relaxing form of exercise than going to do a HIIT session, for example. Stress and sleep. Now, this can be a quite funny one. It is a, a cycle, basically, uh, quite a vicious cycle. So if you don't sleep well at night, you produce more stress hormones. The next day you feel more stress, which makes the following night harder to sleep. So, you know, you can't win <laughs> one way or the other. And this is because the brain chemicals connected with deep sleep are the same ones that tell the body to stop the production of the stress hormones, in particular cortisol, which makes you feel more alert um, and you kind of stop, will stop you wanting or being able to fall asleep. So tip then is if you're feeling stressed, you have to get out of the vicious stress cycle to help with the sleep cycle. So try and use breathing techniques to calm you down. Ensure that you take some time out. If you're really stressed at work, you make sure you have a lunch break. Go for a walk at lunch to kind of clear your head. Talk to someone and also ensure that you have a, a healthy, balanced diet. You know, you've got your five a day, you're basing your meals around carbohydrates. You have some protein from both plant and animal source um, and that that should help. So just some overall tips on sleep then. Factor in your eating patterns. So. You don't necessarily want a real heavy carbohydrate meal before you go to bed, but equally having a little bit of carbohydrate, um, such as a bowl of cereal, cereal bar, may actually help with the production of melatonin, which may make you feel more drowsy and help you go to sleep. Um, however, you don't want to be eating a spicy curry just before you go to bed. That may give you heartburn and stop you from um, falling asleep or having a good night's sleep. So. Factor in what you're eating if you're having problems sleeping. Allow yourself time to wind down before bed. You know, if you've had a real busy day and your mind's really active, you need to slow your mind down so that you start to relax more, ease yourself in to go into sleep, and hopefully that will help. Avoid bright lights and technology before you go to bed. So as we've discussed, you know, the production of melatonin is higher when it's darker. If you're looking at a bright screen, that's going to reduce the production of it and that's going to not help you get to sleep. Ensure your room is of an ambient temperature. So as we discussed with exercise, you know, we are when we exercise, our body temperature rises and that can prevent us from having a good night's sleep if we do it too close to bedtime. So, you know, again, if we if it's really warm, like a warm summer's night, you know, can you open the window to let some fresh air in to make it a, a much more comfortable temperature to fall asleep? If you're really struggling to go get 
to get to sleep, get up and go into another room, either read a book, listen to some, some music, you know, do something that will help relax you a little bit and hopefully help you unwind a little bit more and help you fall asleep. So that is the end of our understanding sleep um, wellness session. If you want you can go on to our we are ess youtube channel where there is all our previous wellness sessions along with short video clips and some leaflets you can also visit our nourished life website which has a wealth of information and a, a whole load of experts on different topics and more specifically you know if you have a specific nutrition well-being query please do not hesitate to contact the ESS nutrition team at essnutrition at compass-group.co.uk. So just for next week, we are going to talk about the Eat Well Guide. So it's been in most of my presentations. I thought it was about time we actually broke it down to figure out how we can use it, the most effective way to maintain a healthy, balanced diet. So we will talk about the five food groups, the nutrients in each of those food groups and what portions we should be aiming to have per day. Um, so again, any questions, please contact us and I hope you have enjoyed the session today. Thank you.